you know, the time that the state of Israel, from what I can understand, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but the state of Israel, when it first really became into existence, was after the Holocaust, after World War II. And to me, World War II, or at least I should say the Holocaust specifically, was like the culmination of, it, it was like the, uh, the the horrendous crescendo to all that had been building up around Ju- the Jewish populations around this group of people that have been um, maligned for hundreds or thousands of years. And because of the various conditions that were emerging in Europe at that time, uh, fascism rose and the Jews were seen as the scapegoat and seen as the, as the vehicle for the Nazis to came, you know, gain control of the state and expand their empire basically. And out of that came this horrendous thing called the Holocaust, right? Now, to me, it doesn't seem like a coincidence that the state of Israel would have emerged almost within a very short period of time after that event ended. Do you see that a direct connection between what happened in the Holocaust and what is now the state of Israel? Well, this connects to something that I actually was uh, go- going to clarify, which um, it's important to remember that Zionism was very unattractive to most Jews. Um, most Jews decided to emigrate, most Jews who, who faced the program, and this is why I initially... Um, initially discuss these defensive strategies because most Jew, most Jews who could escape escape right the ones the, that that is a very uh, basic fundamental defensive strategy if you can leave violence you leave violence right so the Jews who could leave to the US or to the or to the UK or other locations, um, did it? They did not choose Zionism. Zionism seemed to most Jews like, um, you know, like we look at Messianic Christianity, right? And we're like, this is this is just crazy. This kind of manifest destiny philosophy that thinks that something that is written in a book from thousands of years ago applies to today, and that that we have a right over other people. You know, it's it's fundamentally racist. And most Jews rejected it as such. The Holocaust presented Zionists with an opportunity that they they just didn't have. It was kind of a a golden opportunity for them. You know, I'm not saying that you know, they were cheering uh, for the sure. for, for Adolf Hitler, though. Uh, and I've documented this, and I, I, I've written about it, and others have documented the fact that Zionists. Uh, collaborated with fascists, with anti-Semites, and still do until today because there are many joint interests. Uh, the number one joint is- interest is this vision of global apartheid, right, where the Jews are all in Israel and um, and the white people are in their white countries and the black people are in their black countries, right? Um, so this this kind of notion of this fascistic notion of global apartheid is something that was always present in the Zionist movement. It's, it's a, it's a cornerstone of it. But um, back to your question, the Holocaust presented Zionists with this unbelievable opportunity to actually fulfill their vision. Uh, beforehand, it looked like it wasn't going to happen. Not a lot of Jews were, were, were falling for it. Um, and many Jews were very critical of um, of Zionism and 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 I reviewed a book written by um, Moses Menuhin, who's the father of the violinist Yudi Menuhin as well, uh, same last name, and 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 it's a very anti-Zionist family, uh, and who pretty much spoke in very clear, uncertain terms about the injustice that was going on in Palestine very early on, way before the state of Israel. So. The Holocaust uh, just kind of uh, made the opportunity happen for uh, Jews who, for example, my grandfather was escaping uh, the Nazis and the only place he could go was Palestine. It wasn't that he had a choice. Uh, so he went there because otherwise he'd, he would have been killed. Uh, he wasn't a Zionist. He, he just wanted to live his life. You know, um, and I think most people, most Jews uh, who was the Nazis were like that. They weren't this kind of fervent, you know, like the like the early 
Zionists who came to Palestine were very idealistic. Most of the Jews who came in during a World War II were, were just trying to get away. Um, so, yeah, so the Holocaust was kind of, a, and also a huge propaganda uh, boost to the Zionist project, right? Because here we we need a Jewish state, they're killing us everywhere else, we need somewhere we could be safe, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, a question I had is, you, you've you talked about this as well, and I'm wondering how is this successful, is this fusion of self and nation with Zionism, especially because a lot of Jews initially rejected Zionism. How has that been successful, the fusion of Zionism, Zionism with nation and self? Yeah. That's uh, that's um, you know the 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 extremely successful. I'd even claim probably one of the most, if not the most, successful state propaganda effort in 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 his modern history, at least. Um, well, it starts very young. Okay, so um, you have to start from a very very early age, and um, you have to go against the truth, pretty much. Right, propaganda is is the antithesis of truth. It's, um, it's it's a revisionist kind of version of history, and you present uh, you present it from a very early age. Then you make um, the entire population an accomplice to the crime, uh, and this you do by uh, just obligatory military service. Right, everybody is part of the crime. Doesn't matter if you were serving coffee in Tel Aviv to your commander, you were still some screw in the big machine, okay? Uh, that is the Israeli military, which is oppressing. It's a, it's a, it's a force which oppresses another people. Um, then you use fear, constant fear, constantly. And this is I uh, I have two kind of uh, charts that I used in the in a talk I gave. One is this cycle that I talked um, in your previous question, which is the transition from defense to offense. And the other one is just the fear reinstatement cycle, right? You take a population that's already traumatized and you constantly reinstate the fear. They're constantly coming to kill us. They, 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 they want it. the second Holocaust. is uh, they, they want to slaughter us all. They want to erase us, et cetera, et cetera. If every, if you look back at the history of Israel, there was always an existential threat, okay? And now, now for example, it's Iran, right? It doesn't matter that the evidence is contrary to what uh, Netanyahu keeps keeps hammering about, you know, keeps talking about in the UN, et cetera, and people are ridiculing him because it's, you know, he takes one statement from uh, Ahmadinejad, you know, and twists the word. It kind of reminds me of the, of the smear campaign against Ilhan Omar, but um, he twists the words and, and, and he uses that to claim that Iran is going to, listen how absurd it is. Iran is going to enrich uranium, create a bomb, and then launch it to Israel. I mean, you have to, you have to be so uh, completely out of your mind to do something like that because three seconds later, there's no Iran. <laughs> You know, so, yeah. I mean, and, and for what? I mean, there's yeah. absolutely what's the it, it just doesn't make any sense, but it doesn't matter. As long as you keep fear mongering, you have the, the population by the balls, so to speak. 